Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you today at the Converge Summit 2020. I really look forward to sharing with you some thoughts around not just the future, but how we can be resilient and understand how we can build almost a more human experience around where we're going very soon into the future. So who am I? My name is Craig Wing. I'm very pleased to join you, and soon I'll give you a more comprehensive overview. So ladies and gentlemen, join me as we step into the unknown to determine what the future may hold, and more specifically, how can we think about a number of different areas that may affect us today, right? So first of all, as I mentioned, who am I? Well, my name is Craig Wing, and if you had Googled my name before today, this is what you would have seen. Now, I've done the work for you, and unfortunately, this is not me without my shirt off. This is another Craig Wing. He's an Australian rugby player, but his claim to fame is the Rugby World Cup in South Africa, not the one where we just won, but the one before that. He was about to make his Rugby World Cup debut, and he would have been the oldest ever Rugby World Cup debutant. Now, as it turns out, the infamous game where Japan beat South Africa, he was actually injured in the warm-up, and that would have been my absolute claim to fame. I would have used that, you know, for the rest of the time. But this is the other Craig Wing. Now, what's super interesting is that we actually connected via LinkedIn. So about three years ago, you may not be able to read that. It says, nice to meet you, buddy. Keep seeing you around. Hope life's good over on your side of the world. So I start this presentation about into the unknown, and I speak around how these two Craig Wings, Craig Wing 1 and Craig Wing 2, I'll leave you to decide which ones which, have connected via LinkedIn. And how does it touch around your business and digitization? Well, everything, right? Because we may have heard about the theory of six degrees of separation where everyone is connected in the world by no more than six degrees. But in a world of social media driven by digitization and things like LinkedIn, like Twitter, like Facebook, like Snapchat, like Instagram, and so on and so forth, it's no longer six degrees of separation, but it's now 3.2 degrees of separation. Think about what that means for you as a business in terms of the speed of response, in terms of how quickly you need to understand where your audience is going, what they're thinking, but also your ability to act very quickly. And I'm not saying just react, but also be proactive in terms of how you craft your response. Because of the world we're in today, what used to take 100 hours, now takes 100 seconds. Okay? So to start this presentation, I'm going to frame this around what this guy says. Alvin Toffler, he's a futurist, and he said this. He said, the literature of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn and learn and relearn. And this is such a, a, a fundamentally important um, lesson here. Because for many of us today that are dialing in here on the 22nd of October, you may have thought to yourself, well, you know, I'm where I am because of the, what, the, the amazing work that I've done before, because of what I've learned and I've, I've, I've understood how to apply it. But in the world that we're going into, it's not about learning, but it's about understanding how do we unlearn some of these things? How do we challenge our biases? And how do we push our own understanding of where the future is and where the world may be to relearn a new kind of paradigm, to relearn where the world is going again? Because just because you are successful today doesn't imply that you're going to be successful tomorrow and the days thereafter. Okay? Because the world we're in is not set, it's not stable, it's not around Porter's Fire Forces of established um, supply chains and of methodologies and of but robust supply chains, right? Because it is fundamentally a different world. And what is this world? Well, it's a VUCA world, a VUCA world. And some of you may have heard about this VUCA world before. So let me explain to you what it stands for. So the V stands for volatility. And I've just seen an example over here of the price of Bitcoin. Some of you are in Bitcoin, some of you are trading, but the interesting thing around the volatility of Bitcoin is the price is up and down and up and down, and the highs you know, of almost $20,000, then it crashes down to $5,000. Um, it's absolutely up and down. But the world we're in is gonna become more and more volatile. We're up and down, and the speed of response is so much quicker than what we actually realize, right? So the V stands for volatility. It's also very uncertain. In 12 days time, the US goes, have the elections, have the elections. And for me, it becomes one of those most pivotal moments in human history because I don't believe that the world can tolerate another four years of one that's based around intolerance, around race baiting, and really around what divides us versus what connects us. So it becomes a world of uncertainty, but we're not too sure what's going to happen here. What happens if uh, Donald Trump becomes president? What happens for the next five years? Or more importantly, uh, what happens if, Tr uh, if, if Biden becomes president? Will he even see out the term? Will Harris take over? But it's a very uncertain world. But it's also complex. And in the world that we're in, the world of COVID, this complexity is very interesting because we all think that this magic bullet is going to be the vaccine. But it's more than that. It's more than the complexities around getting a vaccine to people, but it's also the distribution chain. So can we come a vaccine that, first of all, will be a world record? The fastest that a vaccine has ever been created and distributed was three years. We need to do this in under a year and a half. So even if we have a vaccine, how is it going to be distributed? 
How do we determine who's going to get a vaccine? How do we determine if the, uh, let's call it, immunity passports are valid or not? But it's very complex. The challenge around this complexity is that it's never been done before. No one has ever had to vaccinate the entire world because there's so many dependencies upon it. It's the world economy. It's lives and livelihoods. It's about travel. It's about industries. Many of your businesses today have been affected by COVID. So it's an exceptionally, exceptionally complex problem. Some people have called it, you know, it's one of these, one of these exceptionally, exceptionally um, hard problems to unravel because it is indeed a big, big problem. But it's more than just volatile, uncertain, complex. It's also ambiguous. It's an ambiguous world that we're in. We're driven by social media, and you may have seen all the different uh, uh, documentaries on Netflix, for argument's sake, around the use of data, around how Facebook is manipulating us. Think about Cambridge Analytica. But a world of, um, of ambiguity is one where untruth become truths, and where we have echo chambers and bubbles, and the things that we say come back to us. And so we don't really know what is necessarily truth and what is false news, and how do we then use that or how it's used against us to determine our biases and our thinking. It's very ambiguous. And all of this forms this narrative and this, this definition of a VUCA world. Now let me take a step back because let me explain to you how it was first, it was first come about, this VUCA term. VUCA was actually created by the U.S. generals um, back in the day when they said, you know, we are going to attack and we're going to invade a country. Let's assume it was Iraq back in the day, right? Because what happened then is they said, okay, if we're going to go and attack Iraq, here are the plans, here's the satellite images that we have, and this is what it looks like. And you have a complete battle plan, you have a complete strategy. But once you land in Iraq, the deserts are fundamentally different. Where you thought there was going to be a desert because your satellite images are now outdated, it's no longer just a desert, but now there's a city. You thought that you were going to move by ground forces, but you can't do that anymore because, uh, you know, there, there is a city involved. And so you have to bring in tax. But not just that, the enemy changes on the fly. And so this whole VUCA world was a paradigm to say what you plan in the war rooms, the strategies you come up with, is not exactly what's going to be there on the ground. And so what the troops had to learn in the U.S. Army was how to navigate a VUCA world that's constantly changing and how do you as business leaders also change in a VUCA world. A VUCA world underpinned at least today around COVID. But it's not just COVID. It's things like climate change. It's things like a youth demographic in Africa. It's things like changing user experience. It's things like technology. How do you change and adapt to a VUCA world very quickly where an old world of Michael Porter's fire forces is no longer adequate? Right? And it's all driven by this thing. It's all driven around a paradigm of speed, around speed. Now, this is a Rubik's Cube. Now, if I were to say to you, what is the quickest that you can solve this Rubik's Cube in? And sometimes when I present it to audiences, I get amazing answers. I get guys saying, you know, I've done it in a minute. I've done it in 30 seconds. I've done it in, you know, in 10 seconds. Absolutely amazing. But watch this video and don't blink because you're going to see this is a narrative. This is a proxy of how speed changes everything. Solving in three, two, one. Yeah. Did you catch that? Did you blink? Because if you did, you would have missed that it took 0.38 seconds to solve that Rubik's Cube. Less than one second. And this is a proxy for how speed is changing the world today and how speed changes our response and our solution set. Now, what's amazing about this video isn't just the fact that this machine solves this Rubik's Cube in under one second, but the story behind that. Because that machine that solved this Rubik's Cube was created by a number of high school students that took old servo motors and pieces from the old PS2. They retrofitted it, solved the algorithm, or found the algorithm online, programmed this onto a microcontroller, and they were able to solve that. And that is how the world is going. It's no longer a realm of experts, but it's a realm of decentralized knowledge about understanding how do we use the things that are important to us today to solve problems friggin' quickly. And as I said, like the 3.2 degrees of separation, it's a world underpinned by speed because of digitization. And in the world that we're in around coronavirus, think of how it's decimated industries and how it's decimated our tourism sector, our hospitality sector in South Africa and across Africa. How coronavirus has exposed some of the terrible things about society around corruption. But then also think about the speed of response. We're in China, how they were able to build two corona hospitals in just over a week. Because speed, you see, is no longer the advantage, but is now the common denominator. It's now the, entry, the, the ticket price for entry in terms of where you're going. So let's talk around this fourth industrial revolution, because a lot of what we're going to speak about today is digitization. But if you're speaking about digitization today, look at this. The fourth industrial revolution indicates there were three previous industrial revolutions. But more importantly, the third industrial revolution was underpinned by automated production, supported by electronics and information technologies. What does that mean? That means that if you're talking about digitization today, you're only transitioning into the third, uh, the third industrial age. What does it mean? You're actually stuck in the second industrial age.
So if you're sitting there saying, you know, we need a digitization strategy, we need to understand how we use mobile first, or some of you may be a little bit worse than that, are saying, you know, we've got a digitization strategy, but if you scratch beneath the surface, it's not a digitization strategy. It's really what you've done is you've taken all your forms, all your processes, and you've put it onto a digital document, but the end user has to download it, sign it, and fax it back to you. If you laugh, one of the major banks will do that, and they call that their digitization strategy, right? So that's not digitization. But let's think about what this really means in a world that indeed is automated and indeed does utilize information technologies. And for that, let's turn to perhaps the oldest sector, not the oldest profession, the oldest sector in the world. Yes, this is it. This is the church. The church is one of the oldest sectors ever. And let's see how they've utilized digitization. Because now already, as opposed to when you were in church, the collection basket comes around, you have no cash. Well, now you can just tap and give your tithing from there, right? So that's the first thing they did. But, you know, if you're the Church of England, that's one up. But how do we go even better than that? Well, the Roman Catholics did this. Because now you can download the Roman Catholic app and you can do your confessions and your Hail Marys via the app. What does this mean for you at home? Well, you can still go to church at home, but you can also still do your tithing and you can still do your confessions, right? This is an example of digitization of a sector. But what does it mean and what does it look like for a country that's done that? Well, here's China. And almost like the church tithing collection box, these are the homeless folks, right? If you don't have cash when you come out of the store, you don't worry about it. You can just scan the, the Alipay uh, with their WeChat Pay, and you can just donate money to them because they've leveraged the full world of digitization, understanding what this means. So think about that very carefully around digitization because now digitization, again, isn't your next advantage. It is already what is expected of you. You need to be here already. Countries in the church are already doing this. So how do you transition beyond that? The challenge is this, though. The challenge is when we look at data, we look at where the world is going, the, the, the place that has the smallest amount of internet penetration is Africa. And unfortunately, when you break that down even further, approximately only 18% of women in Africa have access to the internet, even though it's a, a recognized global need, it's a humanitarian right, right? So the question around digitization and the question around the fourth industrial revolution hinges upon two primary factors. The primary factor around, obviously, internet connectivity, but also around electricity. And think about that very carefully because as digitization grows, as that bar graph grows, right, as it becomes more and more and more and more, and as we have more internet connectivity, digitization becomes the norm. Because every single business is a digital business. It's just determined by how much you use it or how little you use it. All businesses are digital. It's up to you to decide how much you use it. Okay? And in the future, moving forward, it's not going to be a question around saying how smart you are, but it's about saying how do you leverage this digital intelligence? That's what's going to matter in the future. So what does this all mean? Well, look at the number of years it took to reach 50 million users. For airlines, 68 years. Automobiles, 62 years. Telephones, 50 years. Electricity, 46 years. Credit card, 28 years. Television, 22 years. That top line is pre-internet. That's the old world infrastructure before digitization. And those times are huge, all above 20 years to reach 50 million users. Right? The second line, that line over there, is about almost the first phase of digitization. To reach 50 million users, ATMs took 18 years, computers 14 years, cell phones 12 years, internet 7 years, iPods 4 years. But the once we understood digitization and in many respects started to use the first wave of social tools, this is how that number drops exponentially. Because it took 4 years for YouTube to reach 50 million users, Facebook 3 years, Twitter 2 years, and Pokemon Go only 19 days. And some of you have no clue what Pokemon Go is, right? But the world is fundamentally changed because of speed and because of connectivity. And as Africa becomes more connected, digitization is going to be more and more important to you, right? And to, to show you some of the money, because some of you are asking what's the money, here's a real stat. The biggest earner on YouTube last year was an eight-year-old kid who made $26 million. And what was he doing? He was opening up and he was unboxing presents and gifts. So all this fundamentally changed, and things are not different to what we thought they were before. But in a world of digitization, in a world around uh, all the 4IR stuff, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's blockchain, uh, whether it's quantum computers, many of these things that are underpinned by what you're speaking about and things like cybersecurity around how it's important to safeguard my personal data, what this all means is on the fringes of all this convergence, that's where the opportunity sits, that's where the magic happens. It's about understanding the convergence of these different sectors, where these things converge, and how do you find the ideal opportunity to drive your business forward. So the question then becomes, what exactly does Amazon do? Because this is a picture of the first book ever sold. First book ever sold on Amazon, uh, Fluid Concepts and Creative Analogies, an incredibly fun book. I studied engineering, and even as an engineer, this is the kind of stuff that whipped me to sleep. But if you think about it, what does Amazon do? 
Do they sell books? Do they sell convenience? Do they sell stuff? What is it that they do? Because they've pivoted multiple times, right? Because now they do this amazing thing called Amazon Web Services. Cloud, what does it mean, right? But already now, it's estimated this could be worth half a trillion dollars. Half a trillion dollars, and the business, just as an interesting bit of information, was started by a South African. And that's why the Amazon Center is located down in Cape Town. But one of the key businesses, worth half a trillion dollars. But they also do things like this. They do things like content. They do stuff like the Grand Tour, where these three idiots travel around the world and do amazing things. But it's not just that. They're into music as well, around the music player, around content creation beyond just movies and, 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 and amazing things like saying, well, how do you create new content, but how do you become a content producer? But perhaps they are starting to move beyond that, beyond just selling stuff into filing insurance and licenses. Because what they're doing is they're starting to understand there's a convergence of the where the world is going, a convergence of industries, and that's where the opportunity sits. So where they may have started around selling convenience and speed of stuff, primarily around textbooks, but now they pivot into many different things, they now sell web services, music, insurance, banking licenses. What happens next, right? And that's the question, because it's all around convergence. Because this is their business. The business is predicated around something very simple. This is called their flywheel business model. And I'm going to walk you through this. If you look at the custom experience over there in the bottom right-hand corner, this is the key piece for them. And I'm going to touch on this later because it's so important, right? The key piece of Amazon's business is all about the custom experience. That drives more traffic. That drives more sellers. That drives high selection, which again comes back to the custom experience. Now, most companies will stop here and say, we've created this little machine. That's incredible. But what have they done? They said, well, the growth then must come out. It will eat this out into infrastructure investment, which then creates a lower cost structure, lower prices, which enhances customer experience. And then we'll go one step further. We'll have increased, improved efficiency, faster, more reliable delivery. And it's all around saying, well, how do we grow our business? And I hate this term, but it's really true. How do we grow our business beyond the core? But more importantly, how do we leverage all these different technology stacks to ensure it's the convergence of different areas, but putting the customer at the center of everything that we do? That's the most important thing for them because they've moved beyond this. And a lot of what you're going to hear today around digitization, it's also around data because data is indeed power. It is Amazon's lifeblood. And there's all these different pieces they've tied with this customer loyalty and stickiness where it's like, you know, you bought this. Would you like to buy that? There's personal recommendations. There's targeted optimization. There's targeted dynamic pricing. It's personal. So they use this data to make mass customization because now you serve a market of one, not a thousand. Not 100,000, not a million, but you serve a market of one a million times a day. It never sleeps because the algorithms are constantly optimizing. They're trying to understand what's perfect for you as the user, but also as the company, how do we eke out? Right? And more importantly, it's all around saying, well, let's use this data to pivot and create more value, not just for us as a company, but for you as a customer. But the next step is something more interesting. The next step is understanding how we tie all this kind of stuff together and create a convergence of the world where we use artificial intelligence, we use something called anticipatory shipping, and the end result is this. That little diagram over there is essentially anticipatory shipping, and it's a patent that they filed. And this is all about saying, well, based off your search habits, based on what other people buy, and based on what you currently do and what's in your basket right now, Amazon is able to determine what you're about to buy next, send it to the nearest fulfillment center, and potentially, potentially ship it to you before you even know that you need it. What does it mean? It means a world where delivery is not only possible within 24 hours, 10 hours, or one hour, but potentially that stuff gets delivered to you before you even know it. Out of toilet paper, it gets to you before you even knew that, it was, that you needed it because it's already at your front door when you wake up in the morning. Right? But what does this really mean? What does this really mean beyond the fourth industrial revolution? What comes after the fourth industrial revolution? What I call the fifth industrial revolution? Because in as much as we can use technology and we can use automation and artificial intelligence and mechanization to automate things, what does it mean for the human being? What well, an absolutely incredible talk by a guy called Kai Fu Lee in 2019, this is what he spoke about. Now, Kai Fu uh, is, is super interesting. He was the CEO of Google China. He's now a Chinese uh, venture capitalist, and he said this in his talk. Please do go find a, a copy or watch it on YouTube if you can. But he said, if you plot in a system of axes on the x-axis, you plot optimization on the one side, creativity and strategy on the other side, and on the y-axis, how, if you need compassion or not, he said this, and he's using AI as a proxy. But in a world where we may use automation like Amazon, like some of you are doing already today around saying, how do we optimize? How do we eke out more profits? He said this, if you are a human being in the quantum that utilizes a lot of optimization and no compassion, your job will be taken over by artificial intelligence. As the AI, as machines start understanding, as things like uh, big data start becoming more commonplace, machine learning, etc., AI will start doing more of your job. 
right? And so if you're fundamentally in a world around optimization and compassion not needed, your job will be taken over by machines. But if you move still below the x-axis, but towards more of creativity and strategy, away from just pure optimization, what you start understanding is AI will start to move into your job, but it's still very much a human-first perspective because creativity is still a key component, right? If you're in the top left-hand quadrant, so you need a high degree of optimization, but you still need compassion, the way you work with machines is understanding what the machine is good at and then understanding what you get as a human, such as compassion, such as interaction, such as listening, such as empathy, such as about understanding the human experience. And in that world, don't be less human, be more human. Let the AI do more of those things that you're not good at to do. It's stuff like research, it's stuff like reporting, it's stuff like analytics. And I'm gonna pause you for a second because we see this kind of narrative almost on a weekly basis. Oh, the fourth industrial revolution and AI is ushering a mass loss of jobs of so many thousands, of so many hundreds of thousands, in fact, right? So many jobs are going to be, going to be decimated. So many industries are going to be replaced by machines. But it's not about wholesale job changes, but it's about the micro tasks. Think about the tasks that you do in your daily job, the little things that you do. How do you optimize that? How do you understand which one of those tasks can be done by a machine? And as I said before, understand that then the human piece do more of that. So it's not wholesale jobs, but it's understanding the micro tasks. And finally, in the top right-hand quadrant, if you need a high degree of compassion, you still need creativity and strategy, right? Then it's almost always human-driven first and you use AI where you're applicable. Now, the challenge with a lot of companies, a lot of companies, specifically old world industry companies, they, the mass of their, cons their, their, their employees on the bottom left-hand quadrant, high degree of optimization and no compassion. And those are the companies most at risk where their companies uh, and their workforces are going to be removed specifically around automation, mechanization, and artificial intelligence. But within that narrative, there's something very important to think about. That not only is human luxury, human contact luxury good, but what the Japanese say in this narrative is super important. Because they say, there's a say, if the work can be done by a machine, it's disrespectful to give it to a human being. If the work can be done by a machine, it's disrespectful to give it to a human being. And think about the power that's embedded within those words. Because as you go and you grow your companies, and you say, what do I do to eke out maximum profits? What are you doing right now, specifically in the world of COVID? If you're only around profit maximization, you will replace your people by machines, by technology. Right? But I urge you to think about this and say, well, maybe function of work is not just about making money, but the function of work is around human dignity. It's almost like what the Japanese say. It's about saying, how do we bring respect to our workplace? And how do we bring respect to the human beings that are here? Okay. So what are some of those skills that I spoke a little bit around, uh, you know, be more human? What does it mean to be more human? Well, the World Economic Forum said by 2022, you know, the kind of skills that are growing are analytical thinking, innovation, active learning, creative strategy, so on and so forth. And the ones that are declining, we know this already. Things like manual dexterity, endurance, and precision. But the world is gradually moving to a world from STEM to HECI. Now, I'm not saying get rid of the world of science, technology, engineering, math, but I'm saying augment STEM with HECI. And what the heck is HECI? It's humanity, ethics, compassion, creativity, and imagination. And of those five, I think the most important are creativity and imagination. It's the ability for us to think differently, for us to think and say, how do we apply novel solutions from one realm into another realm? Right? And this world that we're moving into is augmented by HECI, as I said. And this is also what the IDC said when they did a future work skills report at the end of 9, 2019, November 2019. When they were looking at new candidate hires, they realized that 36% 36, 36 of candidates lack being adaptable, open-minded, and able to learn and work with emerging technologies, pointing to lack of soft skills. Basically, the long and short, new hires, new graduates, don't actually lack the hard skills. They know what's going on. The challenge is this hecky stuff. And so even if you create your human processes, even as you go back to whether you want to call it HR or people ops, create a world and environment where we can start to understand what makes us human and how do we grow these hecky skills, okay? Because fundamentally, even though today is all about some of the technology stack and Foresight has done an amazing job around saying, let's bring you some of these tools. Remember, it's not about having a tool. It's about being an artist. There's a fundamental difference between having a paintbrush and being able to paint the Sistine Chapel. And that is the challenge to say, well, how do we understand how we use technology to create new kinds of art? And Foresight has developed this amazing repertoire, this amazing ability to not only understand the tools, to understand the stuff, the technology stack, but understand how to use it in your businesses. So definitely give them a bit of a shot, okay? And as I said before, this for me is the big thing. Industry 5.0 after the fourth industrial revolution is not just when man meets machine, but where humans become more than just the machines, where machines actually unleash us to become more human, not less human. So let's see 
what this really means. Because what does it mean from a customer experience? And let's listen to what Aaron said, right? He's the CEO of Naked Insurance. He says, he says, the focus of AI should not be to improve efficiencies within a company, but to improve or even revolutionize customer experience. Ultimately, improve customer experience will result in improved efficiencies, lower cost, and improved profitability. Right? So all the stuff that I'm talking about around convergence, around digitization, around humanness, all of that comes at the point of the arrow which is all about understanding the customer experience, about making things better for the end customer and what is it the problem that you're solving for them. That's the key piece, right? So I started with a quote from Alvin Toffler and I'm gonna end with a quote by Alvin Toffler because he says, in dealing with the future, it is far more important to be imaginative than to be right. It's all about saying, how do we think about this? How do we imagine? Because ultimately the future is a matter of choice, not chance. Don't let the future be one where it just happens and you kind of like amble along and it happens to you. Choose the future you want, create that future, understand how to unleash it through the technologies, through the partnerships, and through the ecosystems. Because it's really about doing things together that's so powerful. In a world that's been decimated by COVID, in a world that is more about nationalism, in a world that is about us versus them, I urge you to think fundamentally differently because it's not about those things. It's about saying, how do we do things together? How do we do things which will fundamentally push us further? And that is my urge to you, my final urge to you is about saying, how do you think about ecosystems? How do you think about things together? And how do you do things bigger, better? Because we actually, frankly, need it here in South Africa, in Africa, and the rest of the world. We're never alone. And that is our strength. Because when we're doubted, we'll play as one. When we're held back, we'll go farther and harder. If we're not taken seriously, we'll prove that wrong. And if we don't fit the sport, we'll change the sport. We know things won't always go our way. And the world's sporting events are postponed or canceled. But whatever it is, we'll find a way. And when things aren't fair, we'll come together for change. We have a responsibility to make this world a better place. And no matter how bad it gets, we will always come back stronger. Because nothing can stop what we can do together. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for that. I really hope that you enjoyed that. It was an absolute whirlwind view into some of the things that will be affecting our future, not just today, but also in five years from now. And I really hope you found it insightful. You took some real insights out of that. And please do watch this space around what's going to happen around the US election. Um, for me, I think it's going to be one of those seminal moments in our history of mankind. And it will affect both us as human beings, but also our businesses. Good luck with the rest of the conference. Enjoy the rest of the day.